Hello my friends, today I'm going to be going over my final thoughts about the UED First Light campaign. There's a lot to unpack about this, so I'm going to go through each mission chronologically, give my thoughts, and talk about really whatever I feel like. First up was the prologue. I thought the prologue was a good mission overall. The opening cinematic was a bit long, but it was a showcase of the voice acting prowess, cinematic design, and did set the stage well for what was going on. The mission itself was simple but strong. A no-build segment that transitioned into a hybrid build mission, picking up money and using it to produce an army, is fine. The fact that you had to defend at home is nice, though I could see players getting pretty owned if they didn't split perfectly or mess up a rally, which is difficult. My main criticism is that the unit variety was fairly lacking. The basic infantry and heavy gunners are basically the same unit, except the gunner is better particularly because there was no air units. Having a third type of infantry to mix in and maybe some compositions that benefited you for having various types, maybe the flamethrower, would be a bit good to make things more interesting. Overall, I think it did a strong job of setting up the campaign, and I enjoyed it. The first mission was a no-build mission focused on atmosphere and exploring the facility that the Zerg outbreak started on. It also introduced the best character, Carr. The first half of the mission was about finding door codes and data logs while immersing oneself in the atmosphere. I didn't like it, honestly. I do like the idea of searching for backstory and lore. Audio logs are great for immersion, but I ended up being so distracted trying to find the damn door codes the entire time that I just couldn't pay attention to the lore. I personally had a tough time being immersed because of them. I do feel like an easy part of this would be having the door codes as part of the lore, maybe not just as numbers, but like answer to some question or I don't know, something like that, a little bit more creative that caused you to have to actually read and pay attention so you can tell your story and reward the player for interacting with it. In the second part, the power goes out, the area is black, and cars flares are the only way to see. And it's awesome. I really, really liked it. The second half of this mission completely revitalized my energy to play. Everything after it was fun. Navigating the terrain with the flare vision was tense, the defense section was solid. My only criticism, and this applies basically for the rest of the campaign, is that I don't remember any of these people. I'm sure that Trevor Rand was a great dude or whatever, but I can't remember his personality at all. Nobody besides the car units really made an impression on me. And Myra, I guess. Speaking of Myra, here she is, in Mission 2. I really enjoyed the beginning of this mission. People thinking that the Zerglings are just someone's dog is a great throwback, and it really makes sense. People are confused with a ruckus in the nighttime. They have no reason to expect it's an alien invasion. And then that slow escalation into things going more and more wrong. It just feels right. Going around in a cop car with Myra and the shotgun boys feels really fun. The fact that the things that you're doing is switched up fairly often is nice as well. No individual section runs too long. As things keep getting worse and worse, people are trying to figure out what the heck is going on. The world is slowly devolving into chaos, and it's great. The Rex escort mission was pretty fun as well. The arrival of the army was okay, but then they all died instantly, which was a bit of a letdown. And the ultraless boss fight where you explode the trucks next to him was a great ending to the mission. Except it wasn't the ending. It kept going, and going, and going. Another half an hour on top of what felt like a great stopping point. And most of what happened after that felt pointless. Myra talks about how she hates politicians and wants to save civilians, but then goes and saves the mayor instead. It's such a slog, and if you slip up once, you have to reload. Which brings me to one of my core problems with First Light. Before we had a working custom campaign manager, when Rhyme was making Wings of Liberty Nightmare Edition, we were aware of the issue that you can't have an autosave when playing through the editor or StarCraft II Switcher. His solution was the occasional giant bold red letters in the center of the screen that says, normally there's an autosave here. Honestly, if you can't have a save system, I think that should be the default. In a setting like this, where your core focus is getting the player super immersed in the story and being excited for the next thing that could happen, these are exactly the moments that players are least likely to remember to save. If you make a good cutscene, people are going to want to get into the action ASAP right after it. That's when they get forgetful. That's when a reminder is powerful to not screw people over and make them spend an hour restarting. I talked to multiple people who dropped the campaign on this mission because they had gotten immersed, forgot to save, died, and didn't want to replay an extra hour and a half of Myra Davis. I understand that in a perfect world, they would just have the autosaves, but you have to work with the limitations that you're given with your engine, and we don't have that here, and I think that it is more important to make sure that you avoid those feel-bad moments 
than it is to make the screen look slightly cleaner by not having it. Mission 3 is the only mission in the campaign that I just didn't really enjoy. The beginning of the sewer section was rehashing the boss fight that we just had, whose tactic is to ignore him, and then the defense segment was just way too long and boring. This was the mission where I ended up defending one of the super scary attack waves without having my hands on the keyboard. The attacks were everywhere, but pretty unimpressive. I did die once during the mission, and part of it was because I was zoning out and fatigued. The mission was almost an hour long, and really could have condensed itself into a much more tense 40 minutes. Mission 4 reeled me back in though. At 37 minutes, this was a fairly quick no-build mission, where Davis's team sweeped through a city section, establishing barricades, calling in reinforcements, or attacks. I really liked the tactical map on the right side. It wasn't super deep strategically, but it added enough spice to the mission and didn't overstay its welcome. What isn't welcome is the continuation of the forced AI-controlled heroes that follow you around and are not allowed to die. Mission 2 and this mission both had the mechanic, and why? It's so annoying. I understand that it might be about rank or whatever, but if you aren't going to design a dynamic AI that's smart enough to make tactical decisions for that character, just let me have control. Nobody's ever had an AI run off and die to something stupid and gone, yeah, that was fun gameplay. Also, the cutscene where Myra sent everybody to die was kind of weird. I can't tell if Myra is a really bad person or just an idiot, honestly. Every piece of gameplay in the mission was pretty darn fun, though. The rooftop sniper section was very unique and didn't outstay its welcome. The three-foot escort quest for the old man was really funny. Overall, I thought this was a fun mission that did almost everything right. Mission 5 was the first true macro mission, and honestly, it was probably the most forgettable in the campaign. The fog mechanic felt a bit contrived, honestly. I know thick fog can be pretty vision blocking, but these are 200 years in the future pieces of military equipment. There's no way that their sensors can't beat a low-flying cloud. This mission did mostly serve as a crash course for new units, which is fine. Having all of the tools for the rest of the campaign quickly is good for a 10-mission campaign. And looking back on it, it was a good decision, because I think everything from this point on was a real solid mission, and I enjoyed quite a bit. Mission number six was just good. The mission had nice progression, gradually expanding the map as you have to retreat, and then as you have to kill stuff up top. My favorite part was that the mission tipped you off that you needed some sort of airplay in the final bit, but it left that very open-ended to the player. If you wanted to use condors to airlift artillery, go for it. You want to mass ospreys? Sounds good. That sort of open-ended mission design is great, and I appreciate it for giving you a heads up while giving you that openness to experiment. Mission 8 was also interesting. It felt like the UPL had a plan and needed their best to execute it. The five stages being progressed through the mission was great. Everything felt like it had a purpose and the mission had a cohesive plan to it. I think that a worse campaign would have had you build up a strike force of a specific set of units to go attack the volcano. But the fact that the campaign trusted you to build whatever you wanted and fill four condors with it was great. The only thing that I wasn't a fan of was the final boss fight, which used the same splitting mechanic as the Hydralisks from missions 2 and 3, which fundamentally is a mechanic that punishes you for engaging with it. Running in circles is not enjoyable. It's kinda lame. Mission 9, in my opinion, was probably the weakest of the second half. Mechanically, it was actually pretty fun. Going around and taking down high-priority targets while playing a defense mission is a solid formula. The problem is the Ludo narrative. The fact that 7,000 Zerg are running through these canyons getting blasted when a fraction of them could walk up your ramp and murder you feels very video gamey and takes away from the immersion. Particularly when the next mission, the Cerebrit talks about how he used up all the non-human biomass already and he has to work with humans. He doesn't have unlimited resources, so why is he doing this? I think it would have worked better if the player started on a plateau or something that's inaccessible by ground, to sell the idea that the Zerg didn't really have a choice on the matter, and if they did want to attack, they had to use the Mutas, Guardians, Overlord Drops, and Nidises. But for the moment, seriously, 10% of the units could have walked over and murdered me instantly, and I couldn't have done anything about it. Mission number 10 was my favorite. The idea of going around and stealing humans, converting them into biomass to fuel the invasion is great. And the freedom of picking your own units means that everybody gets to play their own version of the mission. It reminded me of Enemy Within in Heart of the Swarm, where Niadra infests the Protoss ship, and that is a very high piece of praise from me. And then comes the finale. From a thematic and storytelling perspective, it was very strong. The feeling of struggling through a Zerg-infested world trying to get that last hope of the broadcast off is really cool. The finale to this chapter made me much, much more interested in seeing how Chapter 2 plays out. I'm very impressed. 
That's all for the missions, but I do have one final piece of criticism for First Light, and honestly, it's the biggest one. That is the difficulty. They very specifically designed First Light to be a harder than brutal difficulty, which you're absolutely allowed to do, but it does rub me the wrong way when you make something specifically for public release and then design it in a way that 95% of players aren't able to play it. It just feels wrong. To bring up Nightmare difficulty again, if you want the changes but don't want the difficulty, you can play that mod on hard, normal, or even casual. We make that option available to you. I'm not saying the game needs to have four playtested and balanced difficulties, but even something like, we designed this to be played on classic difficulty, but there's also a story mode where enemies do reduced damage, would be an implementation that is very quick to put in and would allow a much broader audience to enjoy the product. I've heard so many people say that they want to be able to play First Light and they can't. Some of them have been away from StarCraft for a while and were really excited when they heard about this. Or just people whose focus isn't on being the ultimate gamer. And it makes me sad to know that these people don't have any way to experience it other than vicariously through a YouTuber who's talking like an idiot the whole time. The experience of watching versus playing will never be the same, and that's a darn shame. When I started playing First Light, I heard a bunch of people talk smack about it. And when I started, I sort of understood their criticism. The first few missions are by far and away the most frustrating. But as it grew as a campaign, I enjoyed it more and more. The setting was phenomenal, the faction was fun, the incredible effort put into the custom voice work, music, units, and buildings is amazing. If I had to choose right now, in a heartbeat, I would rather sit down and play First Light again than the Age of Empires 4 campaigns. And if you're able to compete with major publishers, that's damn impressive. UED First Light isn't perfect, and that's okay. The team was ambitious to an absurd level. They put so much effort into this project, and it shows. The more you play it, the better it gets. It's fun. I, I don't give scores on reviews because I think it's kind of lazy, so... I guess I'm done now. Peace.